All right, happy Thursday, everyone. Ready for more carbon up chemistry? Let's do it. Yes, I like that attitude. Okay, um, to remind you a little bit about what we started talking about on um, Tuesday. Uh, who is this for? King? Oh, it's a little slow. Um, we're talking about aldehydes and ketones in the context of carbonyl chemistry. In particular, one of the things that we're going to be focusing on a lot is the nature of the reactivity of the carbonyl group. Um, in particular, the fact that this carbonyl carbon is electrophilic. It's partially positive. Okay, and the, ne the oxygen is partially negative. Um, and we can think about that polarization leading to all kinds of um, specifics in terms of reactivity. The carbon has positive charge, it's electrophilic. The oxygen has negative charge, it's nucleophilic, or well, certainly is basic. Um, and it's easily protonated by um, acids. Uh, and we'll see that acid protonation of carbonyls is the first step in a lot of different processes that these things undergo. So again, keep in mind, um, positive charge on that carbon, so when we think about what kinds of things carbonyls react with, um, it's nucleophiles react at that particular position. Okay, and getting nucleophiles, and we're going to talk a little bit about various nucleophiles. There are nucleophiles which are really strong nucleophiles, and there are nucleophiles which are really weak nucleophiles. And, and so in order to get various kinds of nucleophiles to react, uh, we need to activate that carbonyl group in many other ways. Um, by the way, when we, well, I'll come to that in a minute when we talk more about the specifics. So remember, we can make them through a couple of methods. Uh, that we've talked about in previous chapters by oxidation with periodinane or with um, uh, chromium reagents. Uh, we talked about that a little bit on Tuesday. So to make an aldehyde, we need a, a periodinane that will stop at the aldehyde stage. We can um, make uh, carboxylic acids uh, by <coughs> oxidizing all the way with um, chromium reagents. Um, we can make them by hydration of alkynes or by free craft acylation. Those are the methods we've seen so far to make aldehydes and ketones um, from other functional groups. Alcohols by oxidation or by additions to benzene rings or addition of water to alkynes. Okay, so last time we were talking a little bit about this oxidation. One of the reactions we can do that we've seen before is oxidize all the way to a carboxylic acid, replace that CH bond of an aldehyde with an OH bond. So in essence, this is happening, this is being replaced by an oxygen bond. So it's an oxidation. Carbon has lost electrons because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Uh, and in order to do that, um, we can't the, the chromium reagent itself doesn't actually react with the CO double bond. It needs to have an OH group on a, on a single bond in order to actually form the chromium intermediate, which then does all the oxidation. And again, those details about that specific oxidation mechanism, I'm not so concerned that you know, uh, but I do want to focus on the nature of these intermediates, which I've, which I've drawn down here. So if you take something like a, a ketone like acetone, in water, and this, is, this can be under acid catalysis or base catalysis, and we're going to talk about both. We can generate um, uh, another form of that carbonyl where it's all single bonds, but there's still two bonds to oxygen. So it's just the addition of water to a carbonyl compound, the hydrate. And it's actually, this is an equilibrium. Uh, that equilibrium changes depending on the specific structural features of each carbonyl compound, that the uh, ratio of the ketone form versus the hydrated form can change depending on the specific uh, compound you're talking about. But uh, needless to say, in almost all cases, it largely favors this ketone form. If you look at the bond energies, and we haven't talked about bond energies and bond strengths too much um, for a while. Uh, remember when we talked about alkenes and how a double, a pi bond between carbons was weaker than a sigma bond? 
Um, it actually turns out that an oxygen bond is a little bit different, and that has to do with some of the electronegative nature. Actually, the pi bond of an oxygen is enthalpically uh, a little stronger. I won't say stronger. It, it's more um, energetically favorable to have a pi bond to the oxygen versus to single bonds. So generally, not always, but generally. Um, and so that's why this is, gen this is favored in an equilibrium. It all has to do with the energy of those of the species on the left versus the species on the right. But uh, when we think about this addition reaction, um, we, we, we can think about the mechanism for that addition. So let's take a, a little bit closer look at that. Um, I said this could occur by either acid or base catalysis. And it, actually, if you had ultra pure water, absolutely pure water, and you dissolve acetone in it, I don't think anything would happen. You actually have to have some trace of acid or base. Now, many times in water solutions, you, do, you don't have ultra purity. So you have some way to activate this. But let's think about what's happening here. Um, a molecule of water is being added across the double bond. Okay, um, And so we've added one hydrogen and we've added one OH, for example. So H2O has added. Now in order to get that to occur, you need to think about how does the water, the oxygen of the water, it's got lone pairs. Okay, it's a nucleophile, right? It'll react at the positively charged center of the ketone. Uh, but acetone itself, uh, water with water, doesn't react without a catalyst. That's because water is a very weak nucleophile. Okay? We need to activate the carbonyl to make it more reactive in order to get the water to add. That's one approach, and that's where acid catalysis comes in. So that doesn't attack the carbonyl directly. In the presence of an acid catalyst, so I'll just say HA, whatever A is, um, the carbonyl compound can be protonated. Okay, so that's also an equilibrium. And as a matter of fact, when we talk about this kind of chemistry, uh, all, every step is actually an equilibrium. What that does is form the protonated species. Okay, and by, by protonating the carbonyl, what have we done to the acetone, the nature of the acetone? We've made it more positively charged. Okay, so by putting now, the, now if we have three bonds to the oxygen, we have a formal uh, plus charge on that oxygen. And I can take this intermediate and draw the resonance form for it, right? If we take the electrons and push them up onto the oxygen. We could write it like this, with a full plus charge on the carbon. That was the difference between this risk and these resonance and structures I've just drawn here and the one I talked about on the first slide where I showed you the carbonyl and just the C plus and O minus. Because there's no O minus. Okay, so overall, that's a positively charged species. It's got to be more electrophilic, more reactive than the carbonyl without the proton, right? So that's a key point. This is more reactive, more electrophilic. And you really don't need much um, in this equilibrium. Even if this, even if this equilibrium lies largely to the acetone side itself, just the protonation step or the protonation deprotonation, as long as you're forming a little bit of this, that's the only thing that water can react with. So as long as that's formed, water can react. And you take this intermediate, oh boy, I drew this a little bit too big. Okay, and you take water. Now water, being a weak nucleophile, this is more like a carbocation in reactivity. It can react with that carbonyl. So what do you get as an intermediate after you add water? Well, you have the OH here, and then you have water added to that carbon. 
H2O, okay, the H2O has three bonds to oxygen, so it's, it's a, a formal plus charge on that oxygen. That's also reversible. That, that oxygen, that water could come back off and go back. Okay, so that's happening back and forth. Um, but then something else could happen from there, right? What's the next step to get to the product? You depronate. You reform the acid catalyst. HA, we started with HA here. Um, of course, when I've given up that proton, there's whatever, A minus floating around. That can grab a proton from that positively charged oxygen and that would give the product now with two OH groups and HA back. Okay. So that step also is reversible. If you have the hydrate in the presence of acid, you can protonate either one of those oxygens and get back to this intermediate where one of the oxygens has two protons on it. That water could come off, you could form that intermediate, then that could be deprotonated by A minus and go back. So all of these steps in the forward direction to make a hydrate can occur in the reverse direction exactly the same. I mean, that's, a, that's why it's an e uh, equilibrium when we do it under these conditions. And this is important, this um, activation of the carbonyl is key for a lot of different reactions. And we can do that activation not just with protons. How else do you think we could do a similar kind of activation of the carbonyl? What else do you know that uh, is, is, would make it positively charged besides a proton? Proton is an acid, right? Bronson Lowry acid. Do we have no other kinds of acids that are not protons? A Lewis acid, metal salts or metals, uh, cationic metals, many of them can also bind to the oxygen and make that carbonyl more reactive or more, elect more positively charged. So that's how Lewis acids can catalyze a reaction too. Proton is, is just have to be a specific Bronsted acid, but um, it's, it's forming a bond to the oxygen lone pair, making a formal plus charge. Other metals can do that as well. Okay, so in this case, under acidic conditions, under acidic conditions, we have activated the carbonyl to make it more reactive, so a weak nucleophile like oxygen of water can react with the carbonyl carbon. Okay? How do you think this occurs under basic conditions? So instead of HA, let's say I use some um, uh, hydroxide, OH minus, as a catalyst. How do you think OH minus might react with the carbonyl? It'll react at the, well, remember, resonance forms so don't really exist. It'll react with the carbon, yes, by, which has the positive charge. The OH minus is a strong enough nucleophile to react with the acetone that doesn't have a proton on it. Okay? So instead of, instead of making the carbonyl more reactive, what we've done is we've made the nucleophile more reactive by using a base catalyst. So instead of protonating, what happens is you actually add and, and we form this intermediate, nucleophilic addition. So we're just using a stronger nucleophile. Instead of making the carbonyl more electrophilic, we make the nucleophile stronger because it has a full negative charge now, more reactive. 
So we can do that addition. Um, and then to get to the product and to show how OH- is actually a catalyst in the reaction, what do you think the next step is? What do you have to do? Protonate. And what are we going to protonate it with? H2O. That's the only proton source. We'll put the proton on that O minus, and then that regenerates the OH minus catalyst. Okay, so actually, uh, the OH minus, your hydroxide, is being used in a catalytic amount throughout this process. Um, so under base catalysis, this um, uh, this process also can form hydrates. Although I have to say it's a more facile or easier doing acid catalysis for hydrates. But this is a, uh, a mechanism which can do this as well. Um, what else was I going to say about this? So the hydrate. The hydrates are important, um, uh, but they are not very stable. And because of the thermodynamics, the, the reversibility of these uh, to get back to the ketone form is usually prevalent. Uh, one of the exceptions, and there are, there are a few structural features of various aldehydes and ketones that favor the hydrate form. Formaldehyde is one of them. For some reason, formaldehyde is more stable and lower energy in this hydrate form. I think I mentioned that on Tuesday as well. Uh, so when you think about formaldehyde, actually because of that property of formaldehyde, that the hydrate is more stable than the uh, the double bond form. That's why it's such a good fixative agent for preserving tissues. Okay, because what it uh, what it does chemically, if you're interested, formate uh, uh, formaldehyde when when it reacts with tissues, it does similar kind of chemistry like this. But instead of water as the nucleophile being added, it's amine groups or thiol groups from proteins, or even DNA that are reacting. So what you have then is like a protein, here's my generic structure of a protein, that might have one amino acid that has an NH2 group on it, that can react with the formaldehyde. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of this chemistry in a minute. And another protein can, so what you end up actually is making chains or cross-linking proteins and even DNA with that CH2 group of the formaldehyde. Okay, this could be another protein, um, or with thiols. Um, in any case, because it favors this sp3 form, there's still two hetero atoms. In this case, it could be something besides oxygen. Nitrogen, sulfur, other things that are present in proteins and uh, tissues, biological tissues. So what that does is it cross-links them all and fixes them and makes them so their structure kind of permanent. That's how it's preserving tissues which is kind of cool. But it's all this chemistry of a carbonyl compound. Because of the electrophilic nature of the carbon, of the carbonyl. Why don't microbes do that? Oh, um, I think they would. There are some that probably would. Microbes probably would. Um, I actually don't know how long those could be preserved for. But they're, they're kept in those solutions. They're not done and then taken out. So. That might be part of it. Well, let's take a look at some of these nucleophiles. I mentioned water as one of the nucleophiles, but that's not the only kind of nucleophile we can add to a carbonyl compounds. Um, some nucleophiles react best. Uh, well, we can add neutral nucleophiles under acidic conditions. Okay, neutral nucleophiles. I showed you water. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of these others, like alcohol. We can certainly do the same kind of addition to a carbonyl with alcohol with acid catalysis. Or amines, as I alluded to with the formaldehyde. Um, and again, these are weak nucleophiles. They, they don't have a negative charge. They're usually neutral. 
Um, at some point, a proton would come off of them later, but we start then with some kind of acidic condition so you can protonate the carbonyl and activate it. As I just showed you, the base conditions, hydroxide, we can do base catalyze hydration of a carbonyl. That's a stronger nucleophile. It's can, it can react without having to activate the carbonyl compound because it's strong enough. Um, whenever we think about chemistry under basic conditions, I never want to see anyone draw a carbyl cation or draw an O+. Um, we're talking about negatively charged species and intermediates under basic conditions and positively charged species under acidic conditions. That, hopefully that's pretty apparent. Um, but we've seen some other nucleophiles as well, strong nucleophiles, right? Hydrides like sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. Those are pretty strong nucleophiles. Carbanions in the form of Grignard reagents. Magnesium, Grignard reagents, the magnesium uh, halides, right? Other kinds of carbanions reacts too. Lithium, carbon lithiums, anything that you have a C minus. Uh, alkoxides, similar to hydroxides. Um, cyanides, these all have negative charges under kind of basic conditions typically. Okay, so hopefully you'll be, you should be able to recognize whether a nucleophile is weak or strong. One big key is does it have a negative charge or is it neutral? Okay, so uh, um, going back to look at some of these. Uh, in actuality, when we when we looked at this reduction of carbonyls before using these hydride reagents, um, we have weaker hydride reagents and stronger hydride reagents. Uh, as we talked about, that sodium borohydride will react well with aldehydes and ketones. Aldehydes and ketones are more electrophilic than carboxylic acid derivatives. Actually, that's something I should make sure you, you're uh, pretty clear about. If you have an aldehyde or a ketone, let's just take an aldehyde, and think about the resonance form here. Okay. Uh, compare that to let's say a carboxylic acid carbonyl or an ester. Let's just take the methyl ester. Okay, why would you think the positive charge nature of that carbon would be less for the ester than it would be for the aldehyde? Not necessarily a bigger molecule, but something must be stabilizing that plus charge. Okay, And that is, when you have other atoms attached, notice that this OCH3 group also has lone pairs. You can draw another resonance form where that lone pair comes down. Sorry, I'm running out of room here. I'll draw it like this. Okay, so it's actually neutralizing some of the plus charge on the carbon by donation from the other oxygen. Or if it's a nitrogen, donation from a lone pair from another nitrogen. So the plus charge that's on this carbon is, is less than the plus charge nature without another donor group. Okay, so that, it's that other oxygen which is strongly donating. So that's why we need to have something which is a stronger reagent with esters or acids or things like that than aldehydes and ketones. Um, and uh, again, to, to help make this a little more clear, what makes lithium aluminum hydride a better reagent or, or react with this weaker electrophile where sodium borohydride won't? It's actually partly due to the boron or aluminum hydrogen bonds. Yes, the hydride is a little more reactive. 
But there's also a Lewis acid present. And lithium is a better Lewis acid than sodium. So that counter ion also is part of that uh, reagent. So um, the lithium cation, for example, lithium can activate carbonyls. And if you can activate the ester with a lithium cation and make it more reactive, then the you don't need quite as strong of a hydride reagent. So that's actually one of the aspects of that. that the difference between sodium and lithium is not just because one's sodium and one's lithium. It actually is a reactivity difference. Um, sometimes these things have a combination of ways in which the reactivity of the uh, electrophile, the carbonyl, is modulated, depending on what you're reacting with. Um, but anyway, this is an example of, a, of hydride reagents. We've seen that before. Uh, we've seen examples of the Grignard reagents reacting. The magnesium also in this is not just solely a spectator. It also uh, for, acts like a Lewis acid to help that reaction as well. So not only do you have the nucleophile in these reagents, so the carbon minus, oh shoot, I keep doing that. Not only do you have the carbon minus in this case, but you have the magnesium Lewis acid, which helps also. Um, so I, I haven't shown it specifically there, but you can think about those magnesium salts coordinating to the oxygen, making it more reactive. That obviously helps the reaction to go. Okay. So again, I just wanted to uh, reiterate this theme that uh, not only do we have issues of uh, strength of nucleophile, but the ability to activate the carbonyl make it more or less reactive also matters in all of this chemistry. Okay, well, let's, let's take a, a close look again at this general idea then of acids versus bases um, in terms of this uh, activation. Um, we we got, went through the mechan this mechanisms for the hydration. So if you look at this, this, this is what I drew before. Uh, but I want to think about this a little bit more in terms of the differences between acid activation makes the carbonyl more reactive versus base, which is a more reactive nucleophile or a stronger nucleophile. Okay, carbonyl activated, weak nucleophiles can add, um, and we can do hydration in this way. Okay, base. The OH minus adds first, and then the O minus that's generated from that process gets protonated. And this works um, with water. This equilibrium is all happening. Okay? The hydrate itself generally is not very stable. Um, but if we use other kinds of nucleophiles, these forms do tend to be more stable. And one of those is... Um, uh, what we call an acetal, acetal, or a ketal if it's from a ketone. Sometimes that's used as well. So in this case, instead of having two OH groups, we have carbons on those oxygens instead of hydrogens, and and that results from the addition not of water to a carbonyl compound, but of two molecules of an alcohol. And we're going to talk uh, uh, again about details of this. But notice in this process, it's, it's very similar to adding water. But when we added water, we already had one OH, and we added the OH from the water. In this case, the oxygen from the ketone actually is lost as water. That's a byproduct. And so you notice I've shown minus H2O here. That's because in that uh, step, water comes off because we've added two molecules of the alcohol. So the, both of those oxygens came from the alcohol. Okay, so it's like adding, um, adding when we did the hydration, adding water once and then adding water again. In this case, we're adding an alcohol once. Getting this intermediate, which is not very stable, where we have one OH and one OR group, some carbon group, 
We call that a hemiacetal because it's halfway to the acetal structure. So this is generally done, although you could, in principle, think about doing this under base conditions with RO minus. Uh, it's generally best done under acidic conditions. And so there's an acid catalyst. So how do you think this process works? What, do, what is the first step in, in this process? We have alcohol, we have ketone, we have acid catalyst. Nothing is going to happen between this neutral nucleophile and the ketone until you make something more reactive. And in this case, under acidic conditions, we're making the carbonyl more reactive by protonating it. Okay, so that, just like the first step of adding water, the first step of adding an alcohol would be to protonate it. And I can draw both resonance forms from this intermediate. I can break that double bond and put the, C, the plus charge on the carbon. Um, I'm not going to do that for clarity at this moment. I do have that all printed out, I think, in the slides in a minute. Um, but now that we've activated that, then the neutral alcohol can react, right? So whatever that alcohol is, I'll just say it's um, methanol. Okay, the next step would be methanol adds to the carbonyl carbon. Okay, what do you think that intermediate looks like? It's going to be a tetrahedral intermediate. We're going to have OH. That, kind, that came from the protonated ketone oxygen, right? And then on this side, we have CH3 and proton. We added methanol. Okay. Now, to get to the hemiacetal intermediate, what do we have to do? Take the proton off. Right? We regenerate the acid catalyst. Uh, I didn't put A minus here, but there's obviously some counter ion. I'll just draw it in there. That takes the proton, giving those electrons back to the oxygen. That forms our hemiacetal. By the way, again, just like in adding water, every step of this is reversible. Okay, so that's exactly the same as adding water. Instead of water, we added one molecule of methanol. Now we have to do something to get the second molecule of methanol to add. Uh, so what, what, do we, what do you think we have to do? So think about this process I've already drawn here. I have, and think about the reverse. If you wanted to take um, one of these off, either the methanol or the OH group. Okay, To take the methanol off, you would just do the reverse process this way. In other words, you have to first put a proton on the methanol, and then that carbon oxygen bond would break to free up methanol and form an intermediate like this, and then you take that proton back off of there. Okay, so the first step to go from this back to here would involve what? Adding a proton. So you, you take that OR group and you add acid and you protonate it. Okay. Well, what if, what if instead of adding the proton to that OR group, you added the proton to the OH group? Yeah, it'll go exactly the same uh, way backwards. So from here then, if you have HA, it's, it's this oxygen which takes the proton. See how that works? 
That's equally as likely as putting the proton onto the OCH3, right? The acid doesn't know the difference. One, one oxygen is the same as another oxygen. The question is, can something result from that that's different? Well, yeah, this bond can now break. You can lose water. Okay, if you lose water, you get that, and actually you could draw two resonance forms for this. The lone pair from this oxygen can come down, and, and it would look a lot like this one over here, except instead of H, it's CH3. Okay. Um, then we can add another. That's where the second molecule of methanol can add. So to, uh, let me just change color here. It might be a little bit easier. So to go back to this, we would add water, right? If we want to add another um, group on, we can add methanol instead. So that methanol can add. I have this better drawn out in a moment, so uh, please uh, pardon my chicken scratches here. Okay, so we can add that second molecule of methanol, and then that can lose the proton to get now two alcohols. So uh, look at the commonalities between all these steps. It's just a matter of if you want to break a bond, whether you want to break the pi bond or you want to break a CO single bond, you need to protonate it somehow, make it a positive charge. And if you want, and that can go back and forth, protonate, deprotonate, bond can break, bond can reform, uh, uh, water can add or water can come off, protonate, deprotonate, and so on. So all this equilibrium happens halfway and then all the way. And I think I have this better drawn out here, yes. So you can see this is the, the full mechanism. Now I've just used acetone instead of cyclohexanone, but you can see, uh, same thing. Uh, to go in this direction, you need to protonate. To go backwards, deprotonate. Okay, A minus will take that back to regenerate that. To go from here to here, you add the alcohol. This is a, a ROH plus. If you want to go backwards, you break the seal bond, but it has to be broken from the positive charge intermediate. Once you take that proton off, you get to this species, which is halfway to the acetal. If you reprotonate that oxygen, you go back that direction. If you protonate the other oxygen, you go in the forward direction. The steps are identical. Protonate, H2O comes off. You have now again a carbocation kind of intermediate. Another alcohol adds, and so on. Okay, so does this, does this make sense? Now, let me ask this question, uh, see if you could answer this. If I want to go from the left side of this equation to the right side, what do you think I'd have to do? How would I carry out the reaction if it's all equilibrium? You do, though, you use alcohol in large excess. You use it as the solvent, typically. So the alcohol is the solvent. If you want to get the reaction to go this way, you need to remove water. So if you have a way to dry it, that's even better. Um, and you need to have a lot of alcohol. So alcohol is the solvent in large excess. And the Le Chatelier principle will shift it over to the right side. If you want to go to the left side, you take your acetal. You dissolve it in lots of water as the solvent and with an acid catalyst, and you'll go to the left side. So you can, you can control whether you have the ketone or the acetal form at will, depending on your specific reaction conditions. OK. Um, well, I, I should say acetals are really important, and one of the one of the things that acetals provide for us is a way to protect a carbonyl compound. 
because it no longer has the double bond. It's just single bond. So it has um, stability more like an ether than a carbonyl compound, okay, because it's all sp3. So let's say you had this molecule. In this molecule, we have two carbonyl compounds. We have a ketone on this side, and we have an ester on that side. And we want to make a product where we still have the ketone, but over here is an alcohol. First I'll ask, how do you go from ester to alcohol? What's that reaction? The, yeah, it's a reduction. You add a hydride. So this is a reduction. So let's, if you just forget about the ketone on the left for a moment, to go from the ester to the alcohol, we would use lithium aluminum hydride, right? Sorry if you can't see that. Lithium aluminum hydride. But if we took the molecule on the left and we added lithium aluminum hydride, what would happen? Oops. What's the product you'd get? Yes. As a matter of fact, the ketone is more reactive. Oops, that should be alcohol too. The ketone is more reactive than the ester. So that's actually the one that would reduce first. That's a problem, right? If that's not the product we want, we want the keto alcohol, not the diol. So what do we do? We have to take that most reactive functional group, the ketone, and protect it somehow as something that's not reactive. Do the reaction that we want to do on that we want to carry out, and then deprotect it and free it back up. So the way to do that is to simply take um, this first, and let's just say, by the way, one very good acetal is, is actually this one, made from two alcohols that happen to be linked together. So you can make the acetal under the right conditions. They just happen to be linked together rather than two CH3 groups. That's pretty cool, huh? The mechanism is just like we described on the previous page. It just happens that both alcohols are tethered. So please don't get confused by that. This one happens to be a really good stable one. That's why it's used a lot. And now we no longer have the CO double bond on the ketone side, but we have the same two bonds to oxygen, the same oxidation state. Okay, so it's protected. It doesn't react. It's like an ether. It doesn't react with lithium aluminum hydride. Then we can do our lithium aluminum hydride reaction. Okay, now we've reduced the ester that we wanted to reduce. That's cool. Um, and now just to get to the product we want, we do the reverse of making the acetal. We take it with an acid catalyst now with lots of water instead of alcohol. Why doesn't the first reaction occur on the other side? Ah, because the ketone is more reactive than the ester. The ester won't react to form that kind of intermediate. Those can be made, by the way, those derivatives. Uh, we're not going to talk about it in this class, but it, you can make these kinds of derivatives. But the ester is a lot less reactive than the ketone, and it will form selectively on the ketone. These have to be made by uh, other various ways. Yeah, questions? It's less reactive because of what you just talked yeah, about. Yeah, because of what I just talked about, that oxygen, uh, positive oxygen. Yeah. Okay. 
Actually, what you might see is some exchange of this OCH3 for that. Okay, we'll talk about that. But yeah, the, the carboxylic acid derivatives, uh, esters in particular, esters, acids, amides, they're less reactive than aldehydes and ketones. So that's why, that's a great question. That's why that allows us to be able to do this. Um, more reactive functionality, you can get reaction to occur there first. Uh, less reactive functionality, and so we protect the more reactive functionality so we can do something else and then free it back up. It's a good strategy. It's a very common thing we do when we have molecules with multiple functional groups. We need to be able to control and prevent reactions when we want them, and we use so-called protecting groups. This just happens to be an important one, and acetal is an important protecting group for a carbonyl compound. Okay, acetals are also very important um, for biology and biochemistry as well, because sugars are all acetals or hemiacetals. So if you think about um, glucose, it's sugar glucose, uh, the sugars all have an aldehyde uh, carbon on one end, and of course all these alcohols on the other. Um, they have a cyclic form or an open chain form, and it's usually the cyclic form which is uh, generated or in these sugars. Um, and notice that that carbon still has the same oxidation state as the aldehyde. It's got two bonds to oxygen. In this case, it's a cyclic hemiacetal. And then when sugars link up, and there are many, many, many ways sugars link up, one of the alcohols, notice this alcohol that's highlighted blue here, if you take one glucose molecule and put that alcohol in the place where that OH was, now we've formed an acetal here. And we can make polymeric chains of those. As a matter of fact, cellulose, this is cellulose, notice this, this means a repeating unit. So many, 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 many sugars linked up. Uh, that's, that's cellulose fiber. Notice the stereochemistry. It happens to be up, whereas in starches, that's down. We can metabolize starches. We can't metabolize cellulose. And it all has to do with the orientation of that acetal linking group. Uh, but that acetal is also important. These uh, poly sugar molecules also adorn the surface of cells as recognition elements. And so they're also very important for cell recognition um, in various things. Uh, so it's just carbonyl chemistry. Acetals are important. Oh, I think I forgot some things. Oh, I think I have some slides missing. I had uh, some other uh, chemistry I wanted to talk about, um, and I don't know what happened to those slides, so let's just uh, pull up a blank one here. Shoot. Because I wanted to talk about, before I talk about um, conjugate addition, I want to talk about um, the addition of another kind of weak nucleophile, namely um, amines, nitrogen nucleophiles, because they also have some similarities, some slight similarities and some slight differences. So let's just think about addition of amines. So if you take any uh, nitrogen compound where you have an NH2, it could be methylamine, it could be many different things. This can also react with carbonyl compounds, just like we showed with alcohols to make an acetal or water. Okay? With one difference. How do you think uh, this process? would work. The product of this, with an acid catalyst again, is what we call an imine. It's a CN double bond compound. Now notice the, the one difference is that we actually form a double bond to the nitrogen as opposed to adding two nitrogens or an OH and an NH. 
uh, although those are intermediates possible, this is the more stable form. Uh, what's the byproduct in that process? Water, yes. Two hydrogens from the nitrogen and the oxygen from the ketone. So the byproduct here is water. How do you think it, how do you think this reaction starts? We protonate what? We have acid catalysts, so we have to pro we have to add that acid to something. Yeah, we have to activate our carbonyl. Nitrogen, this amine is a neutral nucleophile. It's not that strong of a nucleophile. The same type of intermediate that we've talked about if we wanted to add water or add an alcohol. We protonate the carbonyl oxygen. Now the nitrogen from the amine can add. Nitrogen has a lone pair. It can react just like water or an alcohol. Again, every step's reversible. I'm just not highlighting that. OK, it just happens to be three other things on the nitrogen instead of two other things. OK. This, something has to happen. What do you think happens to this? We have something with a plus charge, we take the plus charge off. We take a proton off. And I'm probably going to run out of room, so I'll try to draw it down here. So A minus takes that proton off. And we're left with the neutral species. Now those could all go backwards exactly the same opposite direction. Okay, but to get to here, to get to the product, we need to lose water, right? So what do you think we have to do to this? Where do we have to put a proton? Not back on nitrogen. We need to put the proton on the oxygen. If we put the proton on the nitrogen, we'll just go backwards. Uh, if we put the proton on the nitrogen, I'm sorry, on the oxygen, did I say that backwards? If we put the proton on the nitrogen, we'll go backwards. If we put the proton on the oxygen, now we get to a, a point where we can break the water off. Okay, so then the water comes off. I'll draw it over here so I can have more room. Okay, we get that intermediate. Guess what? We can draw two resonance forms for that, right? Okay, so the water comes off in this direction. We have plus charge on the carbon, or if you take the lone pair down, you can draw the plus charge on the nitrogen. There's an easy way to neutralize that plus charge. All you do is take the proton off. Now you have a stable CN double bond imine compound. So again, notice the similarities. Minus H plus. H plus comes off. Notice the similarities of these steps with all the same things we talked about, adding water, adding alcohols, adding amines. The only difference now is that the amine has two hydrogens that can eventually come off. Water only has, well, alcohol only has one. That's why we end up with the double one. Okay, so. Those kinds of neutral uh, nucleophiles react very nice. And there's a lot of chemistry involved in, also in biological systems for tagging proteins with carbonyl compounds because it forms imines. 
There's some biological reactions that occur by forming amines. Um, and some of the amino acid synthesis in our bodies occurs by forming imines and then reducing them. Um, I'll make sure to write this up and, and put it on a, a handout, I think, for the exam so you can know that. Uh, so, for example, if you, uh, the amino acid alanine. This is the amino acid alanine. <coughs> Your body uh, actually, you know, these can be synthesized by starting from another um, uh, compound, this carbonyl. And actually, this is probably tied up in a, in a peptide or something. Um, but if you think about adding ammonia, an NH3 equivalent, you end up making these compounds, there are biological enzymes that actually uh, do this chemistry, and then it can be reduced with a biological hydride reagent to reduce the CN double bond to a CN single bond. And then when that's done within an enzyme, within a protein, the protein is chiral, so it does that very selectively to generate the stereocenter. So amines are important uh, for a lot of different uh, types of of chemistry as well. Okay, one last thing I wanted to mention about carbonyl compounds. And that is we talked about the fact that we have a carbonyl compound, whether it's under strong nucleophile conditions like a Grignard or a base, um, or a week where you have to protonate the carbonyl first, which is a lot of what we've talked about, you get addition of a nucleophile to the carbonyl carbon. And if you think about the double bond being like 1-2, uh, this is what we would refer to as a 1-2 addition, similar to addition to double bonds we talked about before. Also, like uh, when we talked about alkenes before and conjugation, you can have double bonds conjugated with carbonyl groups. And what that does is it actually extends that, uh, the reactivity of the carbonyl out to the double bond that's conjugated with it as well. In this case, they've shown um, an example of a carbonyl compound that's conjugated with a double bond. They're uh, all p, p orbitals in a row. You could add the nucleophile to the carbon out there on the end as well, because that also has some partial positive charge. Here they've shown a strong nucleophile adding, um, in which case you, you would break, you would get a carbon ion, which is in resonance with the carbonyl oxygen. Uh, and then upon protonation, you'll get the ketone. But you'll then get the nucleophile not adding to the carbonyl carbon, but you'll get the nucleophile adding to the double bond carbon. And at that end, that's the positive carbon. If you think about the resonance forms just for the... Well, let me go to the next slide. and I have blank space here. If you think about that same system... Oh, if I get a pen, maybe that'll work. Think about that same system, ketone, double bond. You can draw a resonance form for the ketone, right? Break that bond. Right? Just like we've done with any carbonyl. But the, take a look at where the position got plus charges. That's like an allylic cation. That's why we can spread that plus charge now out to the other end. Okay, that's why we can get nucleophiles react either at the carbonyl carbon, which has a lot of plus charge, or at that N carbon. And to be honest, it varies a lot depending on that specific type of nucleophile you're reacting with. A Grignard reagent, that's a pretty strong nucleophile. Um, you actually get a mixture of the addition to the carbonyl carbon or addition to that uh, carbon of the double bond out on the end. It favors a little bit more adding to the carbonyl carbon. Uh, but you do get, you do see both of those. Okay, other nucleophiles are very selective for adding only to the beta carbon. 
And that can be done under strong nucleophile conditions, as, I, as it showed generically on that previous slide, a Grignard reaction. Or you can do it under acid-catalyzed conditions as well. So if you think about this also now, just with a proton under acidic conditions, you can still protonate that carbonyl, in which case then you no longer have that. You have hydrogen there, hydrogen there. That's an even stronger electrophile than um, the species without the proton. One thing that adds very nicely to this end position are amines. So if you have alpha, beta, and saturated carbonyls, that's what's referred to as an alpha position and a beta position, alpha, beta, unsaturated carbonyls, um, and you react them with amines under acidic conditions, it actually prefers to react at the carbon on the end rather than the carbonyl. So it, it depends sometimes on the specific nucleophile. But just be aware that um, conjugation, just like when we have conjugated uh, double bonds between carbons, that reactivity points can be spread out. Uh, so is the same thing true when you have conjugation to carbonyls, but it is still polarized in, towards the oxygen. Question? Yep. So yeah, so it's it, these are generically referred to relative to the carbonyl group. The alpha carbon is the carbon next to it. The first carbon next to the, the carbonyl group, beta. And if you go further away, alpha, beta, gamma, delta is just the Greek alphabet. This alpha, beta, unsaturated, refers to having a double bond conjugated next to the carbonyl. I think your book talked about that as well, alpha, beta. OK. Um, Let's see, one other thing about carbonyl compounds uh, before we end. We're almost done here. Uh, before we end, one of, the, one of the things that we can do with carbonyl compounds is use them also as nucleophiles. So if we do have really strong bases, uh, especially non-nucleophilic bases, for example, uh, this base is very bulky. It's a nitrogen with a full minus charge. Nitrogen bases, as we know, are very strong, right? Um, it's not necessarily going to add to the carbonyl because it's a little too bulky, but what do you think it could do? One of the things that carbonyls do, remember the polarity of a carbonyl? The hydrogen on the carbons adjacent to it, if you have sp3 carbons, that hydrogen is a little bit acidic. So you can actually deprotonate that. I'll draw it like this. So you can actually convert this carbonyl compound instead of as an electrophile, you can actually deprotonate it and use this as a nucleophile. And that's a very good nucleophile for doing all kinds of chemistry with. Uh, it'll react with other carbonyl compounds. You can react it with alkyl halides to do a substitution chemistry with. Um, we can make carbon carbamides. We can do a lot of things with this. So I just want to make you aware that that is one other aspect of carbonyls make the adjacent hydrogens more acidic. A, a typical alkane, you can't deprotonate like that, but because of the carbonyl is present there, it makes it acidic, and we can now uh, use that to do other kinds of things.